want a hero, an uncommon want, when every year and month sends forth a new one, till after cloying the gazettes with cant, the age discovers he is not the true one. Of such as these I should not care to vaunt. I'll therefore take our ancient friend Don Juan, to all have seen him in the pantomime, sent to the devil somewhat ere his time. Brave men were living before Agamemnon, and since exceeding valorous and sage, a good deal like him too, though quite the same none, but then they shone not on the poet's page, and so have been forgotten. I condemn none, but can't find any in the present age fit for my poem, that is, for my new one. So, as I said, I'll take my friend Don Juan. Most epic poets plunge in media res. Horace makes this the heroic turnpike road. And then your hero tells, whene'er you please, what went before by way of episode, while seated after dinner at his ease, beside his mistress in some soft abode, palace or garden, paradise or cavern, which serves the happy couple for a tavern. That is the usual method, but not mine. My way is to begin with the beginning. The regularity of my design forbids all wandering as the worst of sinning, and therefore I shall open with a line, although it cost me half an hour in spinning, narrating somewhat of Don Juan's father, and also of his mother, if you'd rather. His father's name was Jose, Don, of course, a true Hidalgo, free from every stain of Moor or Hebrew blood, he traced his source through the most gothic gentleman of Spain, a better cavalier near mounted horse, or being mounted, ere got down again, than Jose, who begot our hero, who begot, but that's to come, well, to renew. His mother was a learned lady, famed for every branch of science known, in every Christian language of a name, with virtues equalled by her wit alone. She made the cleverest people quite ashamed, and even the good with inward envy grown, finding themselves so very much exceeded in their own way by all the things that she did. Perfect she was, but as perfection is insipid in this naughty world of ours, where our first parents never learned to kiss till they were exiled from their earlier bowers, where all was peace and innocence and bliss, I wonder how they got through the twelve hours. Don Jose, like a lineal son of Eve, went plucking various fruit without her leave. He was a mortal of the careless kind, with no great love for learning or the learned, who chose to go where'er he had a mind, and never dreamt his lady was concerned. The world, as usual, wickedly inclined to see a kingdom or a house o'erturned, whispered he had a mistress. Some said... Ooh, but for domestic quarrels, one will do. a day, a summer's day. Summer's indeed a very dangerous season, and so is spring about the end of May. The sun, no doubt, is the prevailing reason, but whatsoever the cause is, one might say, and stand convicted of more truth than treason, that there are months which nature grows more merry in. March has its hairs, and May must have its heroine. She sat, but not alone. I know not well how this same interview had taken place, but even if I knew, I should not tell. People should hold their tongues in any case, no matter how or why the thing befell. But there were she and Juan, 
face to face, and two such faces are so, it would be wise, but very difficult to shut their eyes. How beautiful she looked, her conscious heart glowed in her cheek, and yet she felt no wrong. O oh, love, how perfect is the mystic art, strengthening the weak and trampling on the strong. How self-deceitful is the sagest part of mortals whom thy lure hath led along. The precipice she stood on was immense. So was her creed in her own innocence. Julia had honour, virtue, truth, and love for Don Alfonso, and she inly swore by all the vows below to powers above, she never would disgrace the ring she wore nor leave a wish which wisdom might reprove. And while she pondered this, besides much more, one hand on Juan's carelessly was thrown, quite by mistake, she thought it was her own. Unconsciously she leaned upon the other, which played within the tangles of her hair. And to contend with thoughts she could not smother, she seemed, by the distraction of her air was surely very wrong in Juan's mother to leave together this imprudent pair. She, who for many years had watched her son so, I'm very certain mine would not have done so. The hand which still had Juan's, by degrees gently, but palpably confirmed its grasp, as if it said, detain me. Yet there's no doubt she only meant to clasp his fingers with a pure platonic squeeze. She would have shrunk as from a toad or asp had she imagined such a thing could rouse a feeling dangerous to a prudent spouse. I cannot know what Juan thought of this, but what he did is much what you would do. His young lip thanked it with a grateful kiss. And then, abashed at its own joy, withdrew in deep despair, lest he had done amiss. Love is so very timid when tis new. She blushed and frowned not, but she strove to speak and held her tongue. Her voice was grown so weak. And Julia's voice was lost, except in sighs, until too late for useful conversation. The tears were gushing from her gentle eyes. I wish indeed they had not had occasion, but who alas can love and then be wise? Not that remorse did not oppose temptation. A little still she strove and much repented till and whispering, I will ne'er consent, consented. natures or our own abyss of thought, we could but snatch a certainty. Perhaps mankind might find the path they miss, but then it would spoil much good philosophy. One system eats another up, and this much as old Saturn ate his progeny, for when his pious consort gave him stones in lure of sons, of these he made no bones. A sleep without dreams after a rough day of toil is what we covet most. And yet how clay shrinks back from more quiescent clay. The very suicide that pays his debt at once without instalments, an old way of paying debts which creditors regret, lets out impatiently his rushing breath, less from disgust of life than dread of death. 
Tis round him, near him, here, there, everywhere. And there's a courage which grows out of fear, perhaps of all most desperate, which will dare the worst to know it when the mountains rear their peaks beneath your human foot. And there you look down o'er the precipice and drear the gulf of rock yawns. You can't gaze a minute without an awful wish to plunge within it. Tis true you don't, but pale and struck with terror, retire, but look into your past impression, and you will find, though shuddering at the mirror of your own thoughts, in all our self-confession, the lurking bias, be it truth or error, to the unknown, a secret prepossession, to plunge with all your fears, but where? You know not, and that's the reason why you do it, or do not.